So we're on the topic <coughs> of bold prayer. Not a prayer that's demanding or confrontive, but a prayer that's vivid and vibrant and confident. And most of us know that we have the privilege of prayer, direct communication with the sovereign ruler of the universe, and access that we have through Jesus. Many who have been in the church for a long time have been exposed to various teachings on prayer. Yet, in spite of that database and that knowledge base, there are fewer things in the Christian life experience that are more, more frustrating for the average Christian, or perhaps even more guilt-producing for the Christian than the subject of prayer. Do I do it enough? Do I do it correctly? Am I worthy enough for God to hear me? Why doesn't God answer my prayer? For this installment on bold prayer, we're going to look at some text in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. So if you'd like to, you're welcome to turn with me to that text. Uh, the chapter opens up <coughs> with uh, Jesus responding to a question from his disciples. And they said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. And then Jesus gives a sample prayer, which is commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. Following that, uh, it moves forward with the subject of prayer. And, and in verse 5, and he said to them, Which of you has a friend who will go out at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey. I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me, the door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is a friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. So let's pause there and just make sure we understand some of the uh, cultural context of this. These are things the, the original hearers would have understand very cleanly. One is in that culture, uh, very high importance, very high value was the idea of hospitality that extends both as personal hospitality and hospitality as a community. It was seen as an obligation as well as a high value. It was scandalous for the host, individual host, or the community if the guest was not honored, a traveling visitor or a guest. Second is the home being described here is typical of a, of a peasant home, a, a very um, uh, low-key home. Typically all of people, it's so small, all people slept in one room, mats on the floor. Uh, at the doorway there were rings of iron with a, with a bolt that passed through those to block entry. Noisy endeavor it would be uh, to open up the door a uh, chance of waking up the whole family. And, and if you are, have, remember, are parents of young children or remember being parents of young children, that's not always the most exciting thing in the world, to get them all woke up in the middle of the night and then try to get them settled down in case they're full of energy or, or terribly crabby. The third thing is that not every family had fresh bread on hand. And, and um, in the small community, it, it was very clear who baked bread that day. And uh, it was rude to serve a guest old bread or even bread where half the loaf was eaten. It was honoring to give them uh, a new bread. So if you're in a small town and you need bread, the, the nose will let you know who's been baking and what home to go get the bread. So he gives this uh, story of the arrival of this unexpected guest. And the uh, host had no bread and went to uh, the home where he knew there would be bread. And as we just read, uh, he knocks on the door, and uh, the call out is, don't bother me. <laughs> the door is shut, the kids are sleeping, don't want to wake him up, leave me alone, in essence. And the text goes on to explain that, uh, that there was still uh, some effort. In fact, in verse 8 here, it tells us, because of his persistence, uh, that's an interesting word, by the way. If you want to dig deeper, if you want to go deeper in personal study, that would be a fun word for you. Because the uh, breadth of meaning is, is actually pretty, pretty wide. That's why so many translations differ. Some translations have boldness. Some have persistence. Some have inopportunity. How's that for a word? It's a great word. Uh, some have honor or shame. 
because it can run across that spectrum. Generally, there are two ways that that can be interpreted depending on the context. One is kind of persistence, and the second is honor and shame type of thing. So from one, I'm willing to do this because you're being persistent, and the other, I know that this is an honoring thing and dishonoring if I fail to do it, so I'll try, I'll do it that way. Greek is neutral on the discussion, and actually uh, the word itself can, can refer to the person knocking at the door. It can just as easily refer to the person in the home. So if you want to enjoy that study, it's, it's very worth it. But the goal here is not to focus, get so focused on details, which often happens when we read parables. We want to know every little detail. The focus here, in the, moment, the main and critical point, can't be overlooked. Whether the honor or persistence is the causal agent of the response, there is still an application of much higher importance. And that's what, how the text continues as Jesus follows up the account. Verse 9, I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock and it will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receives. For whoever seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. He's talking about kind of a continual action. Actually, these are commands. Ask, seek, knock. Well, what do those mean? The words themselves are very simple. A variety of commentators that try to figure out what is the deal. Are these three terms that are used kind of synonymously? Ask, seek, knock. They're just kind of all windows, different windows into the same concept. Some say, well, maybe it's an it's, it's a emphasis where you ask and then you seek and it kind of builds up in importance and value. One of the, um, if you want to draw words, uh, specific meaning from the words, one of the most sensible approaches probably is the idea that asking is verbalizing the need and request. Conscious of the need, seeking is an earnest sincerity and awareness that God is the source and provider and knocking, that is the active, diligent pursuit of God's will. But there again, we, we can bog down on details. They illustrate some very, the, their concepts that Jesus is saying, here's a continuing action, here's something to do. By the way, if we use that idea of the ask as, as coming before and, and seeking uh, awareness, God's the provider, and knocking as the diligent pursuit of God's will, that would circle us back to where we were last week. When we looked at the prayer of Jesus in the garden, as he went before the Father, and if you recall, uh, he said, if possible, if possible, if this cup can be removed, that is, if I don't have to be tortured and killed, um, if possible, please. But, not my will, says Jesus, but you are the Father's will be done. And it's very important that that thirst, that thirst for God's will be more important than anything else, overriding comfort and convenience. And we'll talk about that in just a couple moments as we sum up this series. Another interesting note in this ask, seek, and knock, they aren't necessarily focused on a single request. In fact, it can be a, a general attitude or lifestyle, and, and it probably is in this text. It is a regular and consistent coming uh, into God's presence and seeking and knocking, not not just an approach when there's perceived emergencies or extreme need. In fact, it's difficult to learn the power of pursuing God's will and yielding to his will when the only time we pursue prayer is when we need something. Most uh, In that time, we get more oriented towards us and what we need rather than God and his will and his glory, which ultimately, ultimately is the best that we can experience anyway. But the challenge here to ongoing prayer, invited into the presence, in fact, commanded to be in the presence. Let me just pause there for a moment um, <clears throat> and just uh, mention this, that uh, there are some times that we can read a text like this and drift towards one of the things that is a common barrier to bold prayer. And, and here's the common barrier. The idea that God is a begrudging giver who needs to be nagged and badgered before he's willing to answer our prayer. 
I don't know if you've ever encountered this text or any other and come away with that sense. Especially if you're, if you're considering this, this uh, person that's locked behind a, into his home and the knocking for the loaves of bread and, and, and if, if you favor that interpretation, the persistence. wonder, well, is that coloring the whole thing? Do we have to stay after God to get a response from prayer? Do we have to pry an answer out of his tightly fisted hand? If we believe that, there are barriers to bold prayer. But the reality is, is God is beyond that, greater than that, different than that. He's not the grouchier, touchy neighbor. In fact, what's happening here is that uh, Jesus is arguing from the lesser to the greater. Well, here's a situation. Well, this is grudging. Well, God is so much, so much different. We understand that as we look at the rest of the text here. As um, uh, Jesus says, What father, verse 11, among you, if his son asks for a fish, instead of a fish gives him a serpent or a snake, or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion. Now there's some cultural stuff there too. The, uh, some of the uh, fish, uh, visually, if you didn't look real close, could, could have looked, some of the eels and things would look a little bit like a snake. Uh, uh, based on some of the people that research, there was these white scorpions that when they curled up into a ball, they could be mistaken as an egg. Again, more details perhaps than we need. The idea here is who of uh, what father, uh, what we expect from normal parents, good parents, who, who, would, who would give them a, a snake instead of food or a poisonous serp, or a scorpion instead of an egg? And then he says this, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts, that is, we as fallen people, if we can figure it out, if the natural inclination is to give good gifts to our children, which is the normal inclination of most people, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? From the lesser to the greater. Good parents, even though weakened by the, by the fall, respond to the innocent and good faith requests of their children in gracious ways to meet their needs. There's a desire to meet their needs. There's a desire to respond, a desire to, to answer. Maybe, maybe it's not always the ice cream they want. But it's the food when they need it. I would suggest to you the point here that's being driven home is a point about God's character. That God is benevolent towards his people even beyond the kindness which should be the norm for parents to children. God is inherently good with a desire to bless his children. He is not a reluctant giver where we have to beg or lobby or somehow uh, work him to get a response. That's not at all what this text is suggesting. God is so much different than this uh, person at first that is going to respond either because he's being pestered or because he's afraid of being shamed. In fact, in Luke 18, there's a, there's a text that talks about the persistent widow. And here's a situation where this widow is looking for justice and an unjust judge comes to town and looking for bribes and, and, and she didn't have any money to give him bribes, no social standing to try to convince him to hear her case. The text talks about how she's persistent and finally he just says, just for peace and quiet, I'll answer you, I'll respond. And sometimes that gets imprinted in our thinking and yet the text, it says, uh, Jesus introduces about praying and not losing heart. And in the context, is thinking about end times and justice. But even then, he says, will God delay over them long? He will bring justice quickly. Never a matter of trying to force God because he's unwilling. Says one commentator, what is fundamentally at stake is man's picture of God. God cannot, must not be thought of as a reluctant stranger who has to be bullied into bestowing his gifts. He is the heavenly father, the God of the kingdom, who graciously and willingly bestows good gifts of the kingdom in answer to prayer. Another commentator, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of his willingness. 
one of the many lies of Satan and, and Satan's good at his lies is that God is a begrudging giver in response to the requests of his people. We have the ability to go before the Father and say, I'm coming to you as your child. I'm seeking your direction and will. I ask that, I ask that um, you, you clearly direct me to where you desire me to go. I, I ask that you make, you make it clear that this is your voice that I'm hearing. We have that right. We have that privilege. And we have that expectation. That's part of bold prayer. God wants to respond. He wants to guide us. Now that's not to take away the value and importance of sustained prayer. So let me just balance that out so we just don't, don't go too far over, over balance here. There are times when God does not answer immediately. doesn't mean he doesn't care. There's an element of prayer that it's just a developmental time spiritually. Regular prayer, time in his presence, that's how we learn his character. That's how we learn to abide and trust in him. Prayer sometimes teaches us humility and dependence. Sometimes it takes a while for us to sort through our heart and get the right focus. The optimal, the desire, the best of all things in life is to understand his will and respond to that. And sometimes it takes us a while to adjust our thinking and understand, one, what he wants to direct us towards and to embrace that as the best possible thing. Prayer is time in God's presence. It's not just a drive through window for making requests. So there's value in regular, regular prayer and at times for a request as we pray through and continue to pray through until God answers that prayer or, or adjusts our thinking and focuses on something else. So we pray, uh, God, we, can, we stay diligent till one of, uh, one of several things happens. One, that God answers our prayer. And sometimes he answers our prayer before he's even acted. And there's a peace that comes and floods in that just, you just know. He has answered the prayer and you can give him praise even though the event has not taken place yet. But again, other, other times, as I said just a moment ago, he maybe redirects. Oh, no, no, this is, this is the place to be praying. And he redirects our heart. And the third, sometimes God releases us. We have the assurance that it's been heard or we have the assurance that we've completed our stewardship and he's releasing it from him. Peace. Peace is the factor that helps us determine that. You will know. It is part of listening to God. So last week, if you were here, I uh, presented kind of a challenge. Suggested that uh, we listen to God. We take 30 minutes twice during the week and just Listen to God and pray about what he brings to mind. <laughs> I don't know how many of you travel that path. I'd be, I'd be interested. I'd enjoy hearing your story. Whether it was liberating or awkward and uneasy or encouraging and uplifting, scary, fulfilling. Whether it's only six and a half minutes? Seriously? Or wow, wow, where'd that half hour go? That would be encouraging to hear how God worked. There's no substitute for focused, undistracted time in God's presence. And there's no, as we talked about last week, no substitute for learning to listen as well as speaking. In fact, I use little foam earplugs. Even when I'm home alone, I'll put those in just to cut down distractions. Setting aside a time to listen. But let's, uh, let's come back to, to this text here as we're looking at this text and the flow. So we have the knocking at the door, the need, the response. Jesus saying, act, seek, knock. And then comes into the conclusion, God, God is, 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 is greater than a parent. He desires to respond. He desires to respond. And a good gift can be expected. Maybe it's not the gift that we are pursuing 
But it is God who is capable of deciding what the best gift is. That is part of being the sovereign ruler of the universe. He knows the purpose, the outcome, and the results. So as we look at those principles and tie them together with what we've uh, covered in the last two weeks as we draw this, this uh, series t- to a close, let me suggest some principles to you, some key principles. I'll summarize those. They are key ones. Uh, I don't suggest they're all of them, but they're just key principles that I believe that if we take them to heart as individuals and as a church and apply them with diligence, we will be absolutely amazed with the results. One is uh, what we just covered, to be able to stand in confidence that God is a good God who loves his children and wants to act on their behalf. So as we talk about bold prayer, there's the positive, here's, here's the truth. And on the flip side, here's the barrier that sometimes we encounter. And the barrier we encounter is, that, is, is the, the idea that God needs to be begged or pushed to answer prayer. No, that's, that's, that's a barrier, that's a falsehood. The positive thing is God is willing and ready to respond. In fact, the text tells us about the good gift of the Holy Spirit for those who ask him. Now, this was before Christ uh, died and was raised again and the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, guiding us, directing us. All that is good. The sister text The parallel text, Matthew 7, says the same storyline, and Jesus says that God gives what is good to those who seek him. That's what we can depend on. So first, first confidence, first element or principle of bold prayer, stand in confidence that God is good and he wants to respond to us. Second, and this is one that is, is vital as well, that access is given that we have access. This is a thread that's been run through our series. As we pray in Jesus' name, we are praying on, uh, because we have the authority to approach the throne based on Jesus' death and resurrection. We have that privilege. The barrier that has to be overcome is you're not worthy. You're dirty. God doesn't want you. He doesn't want you in his presence. Well, that's a lie. As we stand before God, we stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not our own. Thank goodness for that. We are seen as holy and complete because of the blood of Jesus Christ and our relationship with him. We have access. Okay, so we sin. Even if we sin, 1 John tells us, we have an advocate before the throne. We have Jesus Christ. So if God brings to mind sin that we need to confess, we confess it and we move on. We don't confess it and slink back and think, oh, 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 he can't, he, can't, he can't love me. He does because it's a gift through Jesus Christ. By the way, just a tangent here. There are times when we get overwhelmed by just this heaviness of thinking. And we start thinking we're so inadequate and all these, all these things. A lot of times that's just Satan playing his games. If there is sin that is, is le- legitimately creating a wall between us and the Father... The Holy Spirit will identify that, and it will be something specific. When you just encounter this big, ugly blob and you can't figure it out, that's typically Satan playing his games. He's trying to convince us of one of his other lies, that we're not worthy to be in God's presence. And there is a truth to that. In and of ourselves, we are not worthy. But in Jesus Christ, we are absolutely worthy, and we can approach with boldness and confidence. That's Hebrews chapter 4 verses 16 through 18. Third principle, third concept of bold prayer is that uh, we have the freedom to share everything out of our heart. Our struggles, our needs, it's important to listen to, but even as we share, remember that the true Lord's prayer, the top priority, the top priority is the will of God. The kingdom building, the stuff for eternity Out of that comes the joy. Out of that comes the fullness. Out of that comes the Christ-likeness. And if we get so focused, the the, um, 
the barrier, the, the barrier to bold prayer is when we go in with wrong motives. James 4 says you ask because you don't, or you don't receive because you don't ask, and you ask and don't receive because you have the wrong motives. You're just trying to get more stuff or more money or try to be happy with things here on earth. And the call is, know the happiness, the satisfaction, the completeness comes in knowing God and being in his will. That's where the power is. Fourth, fourth principle, we've touched on this several times, is learning to listen. The barrier that we encounter in bold prayer is, oh, yes, Jesus says he'll answer if we pray according to his will. Well, how do I know God's will? Well, one, we can go into God's word, and there are times there's promises there that we can go with. As we talked about last week, uh, we're in the midst of trials. Well, we don't know necessarily God's will for the outcome, whether it will be healed or whatever it happens to be. But we do know he'll give us wisdom to navigate that in a godly way if we ask without doubt. We know that he wants to develop in us a Christ-likeness, and he wants us to be a, a, a testimony of his grace to others. We know that. Those are things we can pray with absolute confidence in accordance to his will. But the rest of the piece, and that's part of God redirecting our prayer, as we're in his presence and listening and allow him to draw us into those things in accordance to his will, that we can align our prayers with that and see him work in powerful ways. Barrier number five. I just, I can't figure out the right words. I mean, I'm around people that, that are just so smooth with their prayer. And they use these great big words, and they sound so great. How, how, how can I measure up to that? Why would God want to listen to me? Well, I, I don't, I'm, I've never been convinced that God is concerned about our grammar. Now, we did have the warning in Ecclesiastes 5 that, that let's not um, let your words be few. That is, let's not just verbally drool. Let's have a sober mind and a focused prayer. But God's not looking for polish. In fact, he provides the spirit, Romans 8 tells us. He supplies words when we can't. He brings the polish. He brings what we can't. And what a great promise that is. Yes, our words should be few. That is respectful. But God is not grading our words. We don't have to pray like this person or that person or use big words or a certain type of English. The barrier that we have to, that we're not capable of actually communicating our requests properly, well, God's got that covered because he gives us the spirit. Number six comes really out of the text we looked at this morning. The barrier is a prayer, bold prayer being a lack of priority. And when it's a lack of priority, it just doesn't happen. And that's why the call, I believe, here from Jesus, ask, seek, knock, ongoing, purposeful, regular element of life. If you want to have bold prayer, you've got to be in prayer. And it's got to be part of your life on a regular basis, not just an emer emergency switch we swat at because we're struggling The seventh is uh, the barrier uh, from bold prayer is complacency. And the balancing truth is to remember we are in the presence of the sovereign, almighty ruler of the universe. And we looked at that in Ecclesiastes 5, but we must never lose sight of that. That kills off the complacency when we realize what a privileged access we have. Are those seven principles the exhaustive ones? I don't think so. Are they good ones? I think so. They're valid, and I have confidence that if you apply those on a regular basis, you will see amazing things. God has so much more for us than we even realize. 
Every day, opportunities to know him better. Every day, opportunities to fulfill our mission and to touch lives for eternity. Bold prayer is a significant key. And that's why we need to identify the barriers and remove them in favor of truth. Truth. Build these principles into your prayer, and I think you will be amazed at the results. I am confident you will be amazed at the results. I want to just invite you to start the journey now as we move forward this week, but even more right now. I'm going to do something a little bit different as our um, uh, praise band comes up. just going to invite you to a moment of reflective prayer. That is, we're just going to take a pause here. And the invitation is to spend time in God's presence to express to him what's on your mind as you respond to some of these truths. After an hour or so of uncomfortable silence, I'll close the time. Actually, it won't be an hour. But let me just invite you to just take a personal time in God's presence and respond to him on some of these truths. Father, though there's, uh, I'm sure, many prayers that aren't finished yet, we just thank you for the privilege of prayer. I just pray you draw all of our hearts into your presence in a new and special way, that we would experience a confidence and a boldness that you intend through prayer. That we not be afraid, that we not be uh, uh, overcome with fears of failure or unworthiness, but that we stand in the provision that you've given to us. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.